Hi, welcome to Montana State of Mind with me, Montana. And today's topic um, is Murica's most iconic symbol outside of hamburgers, bald eagles, Dolly Parton. Is it extremely rooted in pagan symbology, if not satanic symbology is lady liberty lucifer and drag if you will hey girl. <laughs> honestly there is so much spirituality iconography around the statue of liberty that inspired her that it's it's not impossible but for the sake of um this youtube video it it would be a lot to cover i'm gonna do the best i can in this little rabbit hole of information because hey you're here to kill time i'm here to kill the patriarchal standard that history has been written in so the way this video is going to be laid out just so you can kind of follow my train of thought <laughs> is we are going to start of course with miss lady liberty herself the statue of liberty who created her why the symbols that you can see if you visit her and then we will unpack the major gods and goddesses that heavily inspire her. Keep in mind, a lot of people have theorized what has inspired her. Um, art is so complex in the sense that I don't necessarily think there is an original thought. And you will see in this video how everything is borrowed from something else, that it is very difficult to make a linear path of of who she is supposed to be but we will do our best to do the major themes that history has written down with factual information and not necessarily just uh theories so get your laundry out that you're about to fold or your meals that you're prepping while you're watching this whatever it is and let's sail this ship into a harbor of information <laughs> Who is the Statue of Liberty? Why was she built? Let's do a brief rundown on that because it's actually really fascinating and I never learned this in school, if you can imagine. The Louisiana public school education system uh, didn't really cover this. The Statue of Liberty, or in French, La Liberté éclairant le monde, which means liberty and lighting the world, is a gigantic neoclassical sculpture on Liberty Island in New York Harbor in New York City, United States. The copper statue, a gift from the people of France, was designed by French sculptor Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, and its metal framework was built by Gustave Eiffel. And where do we know him from? The statue was dedicated on October 28, 1886. First off, the statue is widely known and acknowledged by a lot of people to be a representation of the goddess Libertas. She is the Roman goddess of liberty. Now, please stay tuned <laughs> because she is not, that is not the sole thing that um, inspires Miss Liberty. In fact, soul will have a big play in this later on so stay with me here but for the most part that is who teachers and a lot of historians would broadly say that she is supposed to represent the statue of liberty holds a torch above her head with her right hand and in her left carries a tablet inscribed july 4th 1776 in roman numerals that is the date of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. A broken chain and shackle lie at her feet as she walks forward, commemorating the national abolition of slavery following the American Civil War. After its dedication, the statue became an icon of freedom for the United States and seen as a symbol of liberation and freedom by the immigrants who she welcomed from the sea. The idea of the statue was born in 1865 when French historian and abolitionist Ed, that this word 
proposed a monument to commemorate the upcoming centennial of U.S. independence, 1876. The perseverance of American democracy and liberation of the nation's slaves. The Franco-Prussian War delayed the progress a little bit until 1875 when La Boulay proposed that the people of France finance the statue and the United States provide the site and build the pedestal. Bartholdi completed the head and the torch bearing arm before the statue was fully designed. And these pieces were shown for publicity at international exposés. Okay, so in early American history, two female figures are frequently used as cultural symbols of the nation. One of the symbols, the personified Columbia, was seen as the embodiment of the United States in the manner that Britannia was identified with the United Kingdom and Marianne came to represent France. Columbia had supplanted the traditional European personification of the Americas as, quote, Indian princess, which had come to be regarded as uncivilized and derogatory towards Americans. Other significant female icon of American culture was the representation of liberty, derived from Libertas, again, the goddess of freedom, wildly worshipped in ancient Rome, especially among emancipated slaves. A Liberty figure actually adorned a lot of American coins prior to the Statue of Liberty. Representations of Liberty were seen in civic art on buildings prior to this statue. Uh, there's a Thomas Crawford Statue of Freedom atop the dome of the United States Capitol building. And this was built in 1863. The statue's design evokes iconography evident in ancient history, including Egyptian goddess Isis, the ancient Greek deity of the same name, the Roman Columbia again, and the Christian iconography of the Virgin Mary. Artists of the 18th and 19th centuries striving to evoke Republican ideals commonly use representations of Libertas as an allegorical symbol. However, Bartholdi and La Boulay, I know I'm butchering that, I'm so sorry, avoided an image of revolutionary liberty such as as what was depicted in uh, this famed Liberty Leading the People in 1830 by Delacroix. In this painting, which commemorates France's July Revolution, a half-clothed Liberty leads an armed mob over the bodies of the fallen. It's a little much, a little much. La Boulay had no sympathy for revolution, so Bartholdi's figure would be dressed in full flowing robes instead of half naked. Can you imagine if Lady Liberty was topless? Oh, how Fox News would have a time with that. Instead of impression of violence, such as in the Delacroix work, Bartholdi wished to give the statue a peaceful appearance and chose a torch representing progress for the figure to hold. Okay, so Lady Liberty's, follow me here, her second toe on both feet is longer than the big toe, a condition known as, quote, Greek foot. This was an aesthetic staple of ancient Greek art and reflects the classical influences of this statue. Here we go. We're getting into like some imagery that like is leading to other imagery here. Okay. <clears throat> Follow me. The original Statue of Liberty was going to be crowned with the term, um, it's a Peleus, P-I-L-E-A, no, E-U-S. Pileus? I'm going to call it a pi Pileus. I'm going to call it a Pileus. But this word. Um, and this was a cap given to emancipated slaves in ancient Rome. The Secretary of War, however, Jefferson Davis, a Southerner who would later serve as President of the Confederate States of America, was concerned that the Pileus would be taken as an abolitionist symbol literally what it is. It couldn't be mistaken because that's what it is, but I digress. Um, he ordered that it be changed to a helmet. Mm, what a smurfy hat. 
Okay, so remember Delacroix with the more avant-garde Lady Liberty, if you will, she had that hat. She had this cap. And Bartholdi considered putting it on his figure as well. Um, instead, he chose a radiating tiara or crown instead. In doing so, he did avoid um, a reference to, again, the French Marianne who wears the Peleus. Again, this was supposed to represent America and he was a French guy and he was doing his best to like not put a lot of French influence on it. <laughs> My toilet is pillow and the tomatoes. My toilet is full of sweet tomatoes. <laughs> so on the Statue of Liberty, the seven rays of the halo, they evoke the sun, the seven seas, and the seven continents and represent another means besides the torch whereby liberty enlightens the world. According to popular accounts, the face was modeled after Charlotte Bartholdi, the sculptor's mother, um, but, Reg but Regis Huber, the curator of the Bartholdi Museum, is on record saying that this has no basis in fact. Um, in fact, Bartholdi designed the figure with strong, uncomplicated silhouettes, which would be set off uh, by its dramatic harbor placement. And it would allow the passengers as they passed her to see different perspectives from the shadows that would hit her face. He gave it bold classical contours and, and applied simplified modeling, reflecting the huge scale of the project and its solemn purpose. So in other words, he made her face very simple, but strong because that way you could see her from far away. And as you passed her and the different shadows would change kind of her perspective. It's actually really genius because in her, in her simplified contours and shape, she's given such a stronger presence. It's kind of, honestly, it reminds me of how drag queens will paint really bold shapes on their face. So that from far away, it you can see a, a the face that they want you to see. Whoop, and then here, whoop. <laughs> Eyeliner. My lashes are ready, y'all, hold on. Bartholdi made alterations in the design as the project evolved, as artists do. Um, he considered having Liberty hold a broken chain, but decided this would be too divisive due to the Civil War. The erected statue does stride, however, over a broken chain, half hidden by her robes and very difficult to see from the ground, but he did put it in there. Um, he was uncertain what to put in her left hand, and he settled on a tablet to evoke the concept of law. Though Bartholdi greatly admired the U.S. Constitution, he chose to inscribe the Declaration of Independence's date instead as a concept of liberty. Okay, so that's, like I said, a brief history of Lady Liberty, how she's created, the obvious symbology. Now, I know what you're thinking, Montana, what does this have to do with Lucifer? What does this have to do with Satan? She's a Roman goddess and evokes imagery of slaves being free and the Declaration of Independence and the sun on her head. And, and I promise you, just follow me on this rabbit hole, okay? So let's start with the goddess Libertas, and then we will break her down into some tumbling of other imagery and uh, lore that could possibly lead to this link, okay? Libertas, Latin for liberty or freedom, is the Roman goddess and personification of liberty. She became a politicized figure in the late Republic. The Greek equivalent is going to be um, Eleutheria, I believe, this, this word. She is usually portrayed with two accoutrements, a spear and again that, um, a spear and a fi... Fry, Frygen cap, which she holds on the spear rather than wears on her head. Among the Romans, this cap made of felt was the emblem of liberty. 
when a slave obtained his freedom, he had his head shaved and wore this instead of his hair. This again, this Phileas, this um, Phrygian cap, this felt cap. For the remainder of this video, we're going to call it a felt cap because I am dying here trying to pronounce these Greek words and these Roman words. So again, uh, Libertas or the Greek equivalent was seen with this cap on her spear and not on her head because she not necessarily wasn't being freed or emancipated, but she represented it with her spear in this cap. Libertas um, is seen with a crown, much like Lady Liberty, um, her daughter, her drag daughter, if you will. And this crown is also very famous with the iconography of Sol or Helios, the god of the sun. Again, follow me here. So a little bit about Sol. Sol Invictus, classical Latin for invisible sun or unconquered sun, was the official sun god of the late Roman Empire and the later version of the god Sol. Sol was of extreme importance and often appeared on imperial coinage. Again, everybody would like to put stuff on coins. He was often shown wearing a sun crown and driving a horse-drawn chariot through the sky. His prominence lasted until the Emperor Constantine I established Christianity as the imperial religion. But Constantine's actions with how he handled soul and Christianity is really wild because I'm not trying to hate on Christianity or Abrionic religions whatsoever. Um, but most religions, if like... They're all appropriating the religions prior. And we'll get into how Christianity or even Judaism or Islam appropriates this concept. So the last inscription before Constantine the first changed everything to Christianity, referring to soul dates to AD 387. Um, although there were enough devotees in the fifth century that the Christian theologian Augustine found it necessary to preach against them. It's almost as if when you make a law, people aren't necessarily always just immediately going to follow. And I find it kind of interesting that Christians were punished for their beliefs. And then when Christianity became the major religion, they then punished the pagans. For their beliefs. So. Do with that what you will. Despite Constantine. Saying you can't worship soul. Um, statues of soul. Carried by standard bearers. Appear in three places. In reliefs on the Ark of Constantine. Constantine's official coinage. Continued to bear the images of soul. Until 325 or 326. Constantine decreed. March 7th, 321, Dies Solis, the day of the sun, Sunday, as the Roman day of rest. So, on this venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not suitable for grain sowing or vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. So if you need to farm on Sunday, you can. Uh, so that's fun because like the Sunday that we all know as the day of the Lord is directly named after the god of the sun so and it was implemented by constantine who was like the biggest figure in bringing christianity to the quote-unquote western world one of constantine's arc was carefully positioned to align with the colossal statue of soul by the Colosseum, so that soul formed the dominant backdrop when seen from the direction of the main approach towards the arc much like lady liberty so christianity has a lot of um influences with soul Again, this person that uh, is heavily influencing the Statue of Liberty with her crown and her torch. Um, but it's actually really interesting 
how much of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism really just took Saul and renamed him. Literally, Christmas is the day that we chose for Christmas is just listen. <laughs> so the main festival dedicated to him was the Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, the birthday of the invincible sun on December 25th, the date of the winter solstice on the Roman calendar. A wildly held um, belief is that the church chose December 25th as Jesus Christ's birthday to appropriate the festival of the soul and Victus's birthday held on the same date. And I have always said that when I um, minored in history of Christianity, I have always said all of our, like all of the Christian holidays, and I say are because I was, I grew up Christian. I'm not anymore. So it's just an old habit. But um, all of our holidays are pagan. There is no original Christian concept of a holiday. They're all pagan because that's what religions would do. And that's not just Christianity. All religions, when making a new cult, would just go, you're having a party? That's crazy because we're also having a party. Do you want to come to our party? The early church linked Jesus Christ to the sun and referred to him as the son of righteousness. They changed the U to an O kind of concept of it wasn't necessarily the planetary sun, but now it was a son, like a boy. Um, this was prophesied by Malachi, a Christian treat to say attributed and dating to the early fourth century AD associates Christ's birth with the birthday of soul. Um, quote, our Lord too is born in the month of December, the 8th before the calends of January. But they, the pagans, call it the birthday of the unconquered. Who indeed is so unconquered as our Lord? Or if they say that is the birthday of the sun, we may say he is the son of justice. So they literally were just like, y'all are worshiping our God too. And the pagans are just like, we're worshiping the sun. And they were like, right, we are too the son of God. And like, he's unconquered too. It's just like, really, really? Will you have a chance? Come by my table and say hi. The whole family's here. All three of us. My family's here too. So. And there's six of us, so like double bigger than yours. So they're right over there. The appropriation is also mentioned in the annotation of, uns of an uncertain date added to the manuscript by 12th century Syrian bishop Jacob Bar Salabi. The scribe wrote, It was custom of the pagans to celebrate on the same 25th December, the birthday of the sun, at which they kindled lights in token of festivity. In these revelries, the Christians took part as well. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and reserved that the true nativity should be on that day too. Are you kidding me? Now, please don't get me in trouble at your future Christmases when you're just like, hey, a YouTuber told me that like the nativity and this whole concept of Jesus Christ was really just because the church council was like, all of the pagans are like having this huge party. Let's jump on that vibe. Okay, so don't send your angry uncles and aunts after me. But I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, I'm not just saying. History is literally saying. You can look this up. It's, it's there. Soul is also linked to the Jewish faith. Okay, let's not leave them out. There is a mosaic floor in the Hamat Tiberius, and it presents David as Helios or Soul surrounded by rings with the signs of the zodiac. The image of soul also appear in several of the very few surviving schemes of decorating surviving <clears throat> of decorations surviving from late antique synagogues including Beth Alpha, Husefa, all now in Israel, and Naran in the West Bank. He is shown in floor mosaics with the usual radiant halo akin to the Statue of Liberty and sometimes in a quadriga which is the circle representation of the zodiacs or the seasons. These combinations, quote, may have represented to an agricultural Jewish community 
the perpetuation of the annual cycle of the universe or the central part of a calendar. So again, like, okay, we have, okay, we have Libertas. Libertas represents the Statue of Liberty majority. But then what inspires Libertas and the iconography of this, this crown of the sun? And that is going to be soul. And now soul is a huge part of Christianity, whether they freaking like it or not. Um, it's birthday, Sunday, the son of the unconquered is like the sun. Um, but... Another theory that people link with the Christianity, and here we go with Lucifer. So we're going to be diving into Lucifer's uh, hand in all of this, because what does he have to do with soul? What does he have to do with Libertas? And what does he have to do with the Statue of Liberty in all of this? You know, so let's get into Lucifer. <laughs> Lucifer is a very poignant topic for me because one, as an ex-Catholic, two, as a, I had a minor in history of Christianity, I took it so much because I just loved it because the mythology and the book and the history is truly fascinating from a non-Christian perspective. If you can read it without feeling like you need to believe this, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, as you can tell from the information that we have been discussing. But... Lucifer, Satan, Beelzebub, all that shit. Um, it drives me cuckoo banana crackers. <laughs> that people assume that they are all the same. And the imagery of the hooves and the horns and the pitchfork and the roles that they play. It drives me crazy. <laughs> um, and why does it drive me crazy? Why, Montana? Why? This is why. Lucifer. We all know that means Latin for light bringer. It is also the name of the planet Venus. Though it was often personified as a male figure holding a torch. The Greek name for this planet was usually Phosphoros, which again means light bringer in Greek, or Heospheros. Uh, meaning dawn bring her. Lucifer was said to be the fabled son of Aurora and Cephalus and the father of sex. And like, that's a whole other topic of like Latin and, and sins and the names. But sex, C-E-Y-X, is a deity, not the act. Although I guess he might be the father of sex. I don't really know. <laughs> Um, he was often presented in poetry as heralding the dawn. Again, his mommy was Aurora and that's super, I think that's super pretty. In the classical Roman period, Lucifer was not typically regarded as a deity and had very few, if any, myths. He wasn't like a huge figure. Um, though the planet was associated with various deities and often politically personified. Again, the planet Venus obviously had a lot of gods and goddesses tied to it. Um, but Lucifer himself didn't have a lot of lore. Cicero stated, quote, you say that the soul, the sun, and Luna, the moon are deities. And the Greeks identify the former with Apollo and the latter with Diana. But if Luna, the moon is a goddess, then Lucifer, the morning star, also, and the rest of the other wandering stars will have to be counted as gods. And if so, then the fixed stars as well. Okay, so what is the most famous story the common Western person has of Satan or Lucifer or whatever the hell they want to, you know, name this thing? It's not Satan. We'll get into that. But anyways, what's the most famous myth? He fell from heaven. He wanted to take over heaven from God and God struck him down. Now you can imagine this isn't an original concept whatsoever and not even for Greeks or Romans. It goes even before that. Okay. 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 <clears throat> so the motif of heaven, uh, heavenly beings striving for the highest seat of heaven only to be cast down to the underworld has its origins in the motions of the planet 
Venus, also known as the morning star. So literally, um, like physically, Venus drops down throughout the year. And Venus was known as the morning star. The morning star is falling from the heavens into the underworld. Follow me. Of course, the Romans and Greeks were not the only ones to notice the literal fall of the planet Venus. And there is a Sumerian goddess, Inanna, Babylonian Ishtar, who is often associated with the planet Venus. And Inanna's actions in several of her myths, including her descent into the underworld, appear to parallel the motion of Venus as it progresses through its cycle. A similar theme is present in the Babylonian myth of Etana. The Jewish Encyclopedia comments, quote, The brilliancy of the morning star, which eclipses all other stars, but is not seen during the night, may easily be, have given rise to a myth such as was told of Ethana and Zu. He was led by his, stri- his pride to strive for the highest seat among the star gods on the northern mountain of the gods, but was hurled down by the supreme ruler of the Babylonian Olympus. So the fall from heaven motif also has a parallel in Canite mythology. In ancient Canite religion, the morning star is personified as the god Atar, who attempt to occupy the throne of Baal. Finding he was unable to do so, descended and ruled the underworld. Okay, it doesn't stop there. There's more, guys. The original myth, the original myth may have been the lesser god Helel trying to dethrone the Canite high god El who lived on the mountain in the north. (sighs) Herman Gunkel's reconstruction of the myth told of a mighty roarer, warrior, excuse me, called Helel whose ambition was to ascend higher than all other stellar divinities, uh, but who had to descend to the depths. It is thus portrayed as the battle, the process by which the morning star fails to reach the highest point in the sky before being faded out by the rising sun. Jesus and Satan, if you will, if you want to do that S-U-N sun, S-O-N sun. Okay, we're not done. This roller coaster is still tip-topping, okay? However, the Erdmann's commentary on the Bible argues, however, that no evidence has been found of any Canite myth or imagery of a god being forcibly thrown from the heaven, as in the book of Isaiah. It argues that the closest parallels with Isaiah's description of the king of Babylon as a falling morning star cast down from the heaven are to be found not in Canite myths, but traditional ideas of the Jewish people. Echoed in the biblical account of the fall of Adam and Eve, cast out by God's presence for wishing to be a God. And in the picture of Psalm 82 of the gods and the sons of the Most High destined to die and fall. And of course, the life of Adam and Eve in turn shaped the idea of Iblis in the Quran. The Greek myth of uh, Phaethon, a personification of the planet Jupiter, Follows a similar pattern. Okay, we're not done. We're just taking a break. We're taking a break because that's a lot of information. It's a lot of information I just put on your little, little brains of Lucifer, the light bringer, the morning star, the personification of Venus. Falls from heaven as the planet Venus does. And as a morning star, Venus can never reach the highest point in the sky because it will be cast out by the rising sun, soul, Helios, or Jesus Christ. This is not only a Christian myth, but as we saw, it is literally a gazillion other myths. And even the people, the Jew, you know, the, um, the Jewish people who say it's not a Canai myth, it's our myth. Like, oh my God, baby girl, all of y'all read the same book. And y'all are trying to play it off as if y'all came up with it. But it's fascinating because our ancestors saw the planetary movement and the stars and how they shifted through the sky throughout the year and created myths to go with it. It's super cute. 
but it caused a lot of trouble down the line, as we can see. Now, biblically, in the Babel, the metaphor of the morning star that Isaiah 14, 12, I feel like I should have a preacher voice doing this, but um, I'll just end up sounding like that raindrop from Squidbillies. <laughs> My goodness, the rapture at last! Well, what's going on with all these people flying around? You might want to step aside as I fly forth into the heavens, hmm? Jesus will want me quickly. Might take your arm clean off, boy. Oh, oh, excuse me, you do what you gotta do. <laughs> Any minute now. Applied to the king of Babylon gave rise to the general use of the Latin word for morning star, capitalized as the original name of the devil before his fall from grace, linking Isaiah 14, 12 with Luke 10. Quote, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, end quote, and interpreting the passage in Isaiah as an allegory of Satan's fall from heaven. Satan and Lucifer are not the same thing. Keep that in mind. Considering pride as a major sin, Lucifer became the template for the devil. As a result, Lucifer was identified with the devil in Christianity and in Christian popular literature, as in Dante's Inferno, Von Dell's Lucifer, and John Milton's Paradise Lost. Early medieval Christianity fairly distinguished between Lucifer and Satan. While Lucifer as the devil is fixated in hell, Satan executes the desires of Lucifer as his vessel. What does all this have to do with the Statue of Liberty? And here's my train of thought. The Statue of Liberty is a light bringer. She carries a torch. She has a, a golden ray, a crown. That is from Libertas. Libertas shares imagery with soul, Helios, the god of the sun. The god of the sun was appropriated into being Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's enemy is Satan. Satan is the morning star, and he is often seen as the torch bringer, much like his predecessor, Helios, the sun. So, I feel like that always sunny in Philadelphia like bit with like the red yarn because that's kind of like metaphorically what I'm doing here. There's no Pepe Sylvia, you gotta be kidding me. I got boxes full of Pepe. All right, so I start marching my way down to Carol and HR and I knock on her door and I say, Carol, Carol, I gotta talk to you about Pepe. Do so you have Lady Liberty? Sun God, uh, Helios with Libertas, uh, a lot of Roman imagery. And then Constantine loved soul so much, he didn't necessarily do away with him when he brought Christianity in and just kind of uh, covered Jesus onto soul, kind of made them into the same thing, you know, the unconquered, the son God, the son of God, if you will. Now that's a stretch, I know, but we're having fun here. Okay. And then you have the morning star the light bringer, the torch bearer, also seen with a crown and a lot of things. And he is the enemy of Jesus, but also kind of is Jesus in a way. Like Helios and Lucifer are very similar, not, not, not the same. They're not the same. They have very similar origins, very similar concepts and imagery and um, jobs. And so I guess the Statue of Liberty's sun and torch is mainly of soul, but then also a little bit of Lucifer. <laughs> like, okay, guys, it's not lost upon me that this is a stretchy stretch, if not stretch, okay? But we're having fun here. And that's point of this uh, YouTube channel is to discuss these fun ideas because nothing is ever set in concrete, especially history. History is always changing with new information that we discover and update. And so I just think it's really fun in the broad scope of using Lady Liberty um, 
a symbol of freedom and show all of the symbols associated with her and how, let's be honest, conservative Americans are using Lady Liberty as this American freedom and all this stuff when she represented not only immigration, but emancipation from slaves. Her iconography is literally linked to the sun god who was before Jesus and Lucifer, the torch bringer. She's just rooted in pagan ancient stories and traditions and imagery and for the conservatives or not even the conservatives but just the um uneducated american people of all political parties and religions but of all backgrounds um she is in my personal opinion the perfect statue to welcome immigrants from other places who believe all of these different myths and legends because she herself is a conglomerate of different legends um she is not just libertas she is not just soul she is not just lucifer she is not just a copper statue in a harbor she is a representation of not only the freedom of slaves and the freedom from England, if you will. <laughs> she is the freedom of one religion and one idea because her literal roots are everywhere. As we discussed, there's no one mole to whack on who she is and where she's from. There's just a constant spider web of beautiful details and science and history and traditions. And for an immigrant, not f obviously from America is what an immigrant means, Montana, but you catch what I mean, uh, for an immigrant to come and see, honestly, this largely pagan representation of so many different beliefs should and I hope is comforting to those who saw her and continue to see her to this day. I hope that we can rebrand her with this information um, as a mother's son, if you will. Um, again, she has iconography with Mother Mary or Isis or Soul or all these people. So I would probably rebrand her as a mother's son who lights the way as she obviously does, but represents the freedom of religion and spirituality as she herself is not concrete in one idea. Now, do you need to go tell your conservative relatives that Lady Liberty is Satan? Probably not, because she's not. Um, she's not even Lucifer, but that's kind of what I'm saying here in this like hodgepodge of a fucking video is she is not just one thing. She is not Mother Mary. She is not just Isis. She is not just Soul. She is not just Libertas. She is not literally one idea much like lucifer her brother if you will she is a conglomeration of many different beliefs and ideas so i think to take away from this video um just know that one all religions are bouncing and borrowing off of each other there is literally no true all, end all, be all. So uh, my advice is to you is to believe wherever you want, but at the end of the day, no truth is a capitalized T truth. And also things change. History changes and Lady Liberty, her imagery can also be changed into back into a more welcoming figure we can take her and bring her back to her pagan roots and give her new light, if you will.
Okay, this wasn't one of my more um, organized videos, um, but I hope you enjoyed the journey. And again, please, I want all my videos to be discussions. I want commenters to comment what they think and other links to information so we can discuss because um, there's enough uh, people telling you what to believe, if you will. So I always like to discuss and see where all this information leads because all of this information that I have, I literally found myself in avenues that anyone else can take. I just put it together for y'all. So please give a like, give a subscribe, and I will see y'all all very soon.